we'll move on to our second panel of the summit startup to the forefront of tech driven innovation the panelists for this session are swapan rajdev co-founder haptic ai sharad chandra president government blockchain association india sandeep yuvanti co-founder and ceo talent rich solutions the panel will be moderated by kashyap kompela SVP Global Operations, University of Emerging Technology, and Senior Advisor, the Emerging Tech Foundation. Again, please send in your questions for the panelists in the chat window, and we'll see how we can get them answered. Over to you, uh, Kashyap. Hi. Uh, thanks, Shivangi. Thanks for the introduction. Hi, Sunny. Hi, Sharath. Hi, Thank you, Nice to have you. Hi. Thank Thanks, you, uh, I think, uh, you know, we've been talking about COVID and it's very evident that businesses are transforming. So I think very quickly, you know, I want to get your very initial thoughts on how, you know, specifically it affected your business, right? So uh, Sandeep, you come from a HR, you know, talent management and people management background. So you're in a company which, uh, you know, is into that space. So why don't you, you know, because I think a lot of us, uh, you know, we were at home for the last few months. Yes. I'm sure like, you know, being the IT or tech companies, I, I'll also take, you know, Poppins, you know, point of view because he runs a, a, a company that in fact is into conversational AI. Mm. So I'm sure like the, the number of customers, you know, they have been supporting, it will be interesting to see how they would have changed over the last three months. It gives a it's sort of an idea of how business has transformed, right? So I think starting with you, Sandeep, uh, how has it affected your personal, uh, you know, business? <laughs> so we, uh, let me just quickly outline that we have two products to offer. Uh, one of of a product is called Odigo, which is essentially an enterprise messaging and tracking platform. And it has everything to do with uh, organizations with distributed workforce. So to begin with, uh, definitely it has straight away impacted us because the guys, I mean, this was meant to simplify the life of the guys who are on the field. And the moment everybody is inside in lockdown, uh, then, you know, it is a head on hit. Uh, the second product uh, was, I mean, it's online assessment. It is related to online examination. Uh, uh, but yes, because of all the other economic activities, uh, you know, getting sidelined and the hiring and all the things, uh, you know, getting uh, the second priority, it impacted that way as well. But while we were, uh, you know, grappling at uh, the situation and how to get back to our customers and how to see to it that, you know, maybe not immediately, uh, but somewhere in the mid, April and May, that how do we restart, how to get back, uh, you know, actual uh, uh, on field work. We started realizing that the companies were on their own, very open and forthcoming to figure out a way how else they can also start working. I mean, though most of the individuals in the organization uh, were working from home, but there was a sense that let's start something, let's start collaborating, let's start connecting again, and whichever way it's possible. And that is where we saw an opportunity that uh, the product which we created, though it was meant for individuals operating from field, but essentially there was a need to collaborate and communicate. I mean, while they were on the field, they would anyway collaborate and communicate, but uh, even if they're at home, there was opportunity to collaborate and communicate there as well. So within a short span of time, we built uh, uh, this video conferencing uh, feature into our app and uh, which was very easy uh, uh, a kind of a feature for a lot of them to communicate immediately. It was not a, a very formal uh, conferencing tool, but it is like in my team or my small group, I could easily connect uh, with people immediately. And all the other essential elements which are required for the field reps to work were already there into, the, into this platform. So we also saw a lot of uh, individuals trying to adopt to it uh, though probably it was not their go-to way about it, but they, they were keen to adopt to the new technologies. They were keen to adopt to the new ways to continue working. And there was a lot of understanding in terms of how things can be taken up rather than, you know, uh, uh, taking it as a complete disruption. There was a lot of uh, accommodation in terms of how uh, there, there was a lot of accountability to get back to the normalcy. And people were accommodating, people were trying new things. People were exploring new things and they were trying to utilize whatever resources uh, were at hand. I mean, we've seen uh, at different places, uh, we've tried, uh, in fact, I mean, while we were focused on corporates, we were also trying to reach out to certain government agencies to see if we can, uh, 
you know, plug in into uh, their response to this COVID-19 situation where our platform can come handy to track uh, those COVID positive cases or, you know, uh, you know, engage with them, continuously track them, monitor them. So we also try to engage with government entities, uh, send the proposals. Uh, we try to, you know, talk to a lot of such bodies. And uh, we saw that there was a lot of uh, positive responses uh, uh, from most of these bodies. So we were, I mean, though the situation was a standstill because of external factors, uh, but we could see there was a natural inclination towards adopting the newer way to probably to go ahead. And I, I really see that possibly there could be a different way altogether uh, to look at this uh, communication and collaboration technologies as we move on, not only necessarily uh, an enabler, but perhaps it could be something which will become mainstream, even when the other things are available or even when we uh, get into normalcy. Right, yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's actually very interesting to see that, you know, uh, uh, you know, people like, you know, the gropers or big baskets, right? Yeah. So, I think they're, they have become the new norm now. Uh, I think once, you know, they were also probably one of the players, but now you see that all of your, you know, most of your buying is all online. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. Are, you know, bought online. So in that context, I mean, somebody like Swapan who runs, you know, Haptic, which is, which is into conversational AI, they help a lot of, uh, you know, companies in terms of talking to their customers. So how has it changed over the last, you know, two to three months, uh, roughly? And how is your, you know, current, you know, customer like? Yeah. Uh, no, absolutely. Uh, you know, Kashyap, thanks for that. You know, firstly, hi everyone. Uh, you know, pleasure to be here. Um, and you know, yeah, it's you know, for for us, you know, like uh, haptic, you know, being in the conversation the AI space, there's a you know, plenty of interesting things, right? And I think uh, you know, a lot of people are anyway saying this about the times that we're living in, right? Like, like a couple of things are happening which are very interesting. Um, you know, overall, one I think everyone is obviously saying that you know, there's a certain amount, you know, there's they were always all big enterprises were going to go and you know adopt technology and it was happening but it was happening slowly i think during these times we know that hey you know all companies have really accelerated in that right and i think that is you know from let's say a lot of things that happened was from business continuity programs right obviously you know uh, people had to work from home so people obviously for business continuity started kind of adopting work from home tools right and obviously you know we're, we're one of them which has obviously become super successful is zoom you know as we're on that but plenty of other tools that allow you to work and be productive remotely right the other thing that obviously happened was because of business continuity right a lot of large enterprises and companies obviously had their whole customer support center right which were obviously in uh, you know in in large offices or large areas everyone sitting in a particular place that too had to be shifted remote and become decentralized right so i think that was another big part that happened you know and both of these things and plenty of other technologies were being adapted slowly but this time really kind of accelerating it right and you know the third thing that's really happening which we've seen across right and i think that's obviously what haptic also did is it makes every company focus on the right fundamentals of building a business, right? So whether it be a startup, whether it be a big company, I think everyone went back to started thinking that, Hey, you know, am I working the most optimally, right? Am I being efficient as a company and especially startups, right? I mean, you know, we're, we're always kind of in growth mode and trying to spend more than we're building. And I think it always makes you take a step back to really go back to your fundamentals. Right. And I think, this happened across, right? And I would say not just India, but globally and everything, right? And I think, um, you know, we were lucky enough to be at a cusp where, you know, we are enabling one of these technologies, which is where conversational AI really plays a big part, right? So customer support uh, automation has kind of obviously been a big thing. And, you know, that's where we started seeing good interest, uh, you know, and, uh, across right across globally we started seeing a lot of good interest you know we've had worked with companies to kind of make sure that you know we help them with customer support automation and all this i think the benefit of this also is you know it will also help improve customer support experiences right and i think that's kind of the advantage what we know in the long term will get right but the reason to do this was business continuity this will have a side impact on the long term and you know kind of do that so you know, that's what we've seen in our business, right? We've seen that both these things, which is helping people save costs and obviously business continuity 
is where conversational AI really sat, right? We help people automate a lot of their call centers, conversations with their interactions and all of those things. And obviously, you know, help technology, uh, you know, with the help of technology, decentralize that, right? You don't really need to be in one place to do all of that. So that's, you know, what we've seen. I think the interesting thing is, you know, while, you know, there are certain tools which take a, you know, hockey stick kind of curve, you know, depending on this thing, you know, this, at least for our business, there's a lot of interest. Uh, you know, we've kind of seen a lot of people come in and ask us about it. You know, we're having a lot of good conversations. Uh, you know, the decision making I've seen has started slowing down, right? And or was slowed down and started picking up again. But during the time we got hit, you know, while everyone wanted to do this, you know, because the, you know, kind of solutions we provide come at a cost, you know, it takes people a little bit more time to think, right? They vet it a lot more closely. You know, you're all, you, we go through multiple rounds of diligence to make sure that, hey, you know, when they're spending money, it's being spent, spent correctly and those kind of things, right? So I think the diligence period became a little longer. The decision making was a little bit longer than, you know, we had in previous. I think it's starting to pick back up now. Or it's just people are now making decisions based on the past two, uh, you know, couple of months. So that's, you know, one thing what happened. So it's not like, hey, you know, we just grew and everything kind of expanded, but obviously interests and people are asking the right questions and doing a lot of the right things, right? Um, apart from that, you know, one big project that we did, uh, you know, which obviously, you know, was one of the most proudest things for Haptic, I think we could ever do was obviously work with the government of India for uh, the coronavirus chatbot, right? So I think, uh, you know, our, our prime minister also actually spoken about it on live TV and, you know, that was kind of powered by us. And I think, you know, obviously building business, helping clients do all that is kind of what our mission and core vision is. But being able to be part of, you know, something so core at this time was obviously what, you know, for us was a very big thing, right? I mean, we were able to kind of build a WhatsApp uh, chatbot, which anyone could talk to and do a lot of things. So I think it's been a very interesting time. You know, we've seen obviously use cases emerge which we weren't imagining because you know people are people are now coming with creative use cases and a lot of great things and you know it's it's been uh, you know we're, we're hoping for a lot more that this will kind of help adaptation and people uh, you know come on these kind of technologies a lot more but uh, you know that's been what our business has seen over the past few months and you know that's kind of where we are right i mean uh, fantastic so I think, uh, you know, uh, going to uh, Sharad, uh, Sharad comes from, you know, area of blockchain is kind of a thought leader in blockchain. So while, you know, blockchain stayed as one of these hype technologies, uh, you know, since the last few years, uh, we see a lot of adoption, you know, in, in use cases like trade finance. Reliance actually implemented one such transaction in, I think, a couple of years back. So how, how are these new, you know, new business models or, you know, the technology like blockchain so you see that, you know, it's been implemented in B2B payment space, right? And and also, you know, uh, real-time clearance and settlements space as well, right? So as, as a thought leader in blockchain, how, how do you see that, you know, the current times, uh, this can actually be a realistic sort of, you know, uh, a business, you know, for, for blockchain-based companies? Definitely. In fact, uh, what has happened is this, this pandemic, it has uh, catalyzed a global movement against away from cash or against cash, if, if I can use that term. And it has also given a fillip to digital transactions. So on an average, digital transactions uh, were like close to 3 billion per month. Now the government is targeting 1 billion digital transactions per month. So there's a lot of infrastructure push from the government. The payment infrastructure development fund is a step in the right direction. But if you look at uh, some of the policy uh, shifts, I would say RBI has allowed creation of national umbrella entity, which will allow uh, private entities to set up a challenger to MPCI so that there's a level playing field. And given given the scale of digital transaction, it will go up in, in the days to come. Blockchain as a real-time settlement solution, which MPCI is already exploring with one of the leading uh, blockchain protocols, can, can create a system where no matter how much transactions are happening on a daily basis, right, beaten billions or more than that, a real-time settlement can happen and interoperability between these two systems, let's say the NPCI blockchain system and the national umbrella entity blockchain system, which a private party may, let's say, if Reliance wants to start that, right? Because social commerce is picking up in a big way. We have seen good amount of investment in the space and Jio has been uh, fortunate enough 
are worthy enough to land those investments. Social commerce is also picking up in a big way. It's helping uh, digital payments. So settlement uh, or blockchain based real time settlement will also improve the user experience. Let's say if, if I talk about a first time user who is making a digital transaction and if the payment doesn't go through or uh, the reversal doesn't reflect instantaneously or within on the same day itself, right? That will set up a bad precedent and it will act as a deterrent to people who are new to digital transactions. If you're looking at, let's say, tier two or tier three city population where uh, the people are not so technology aware and they're still relying on, on US SSD, which is more like a message based payment system, right? So a smartphone penetration is, is not 100%. We are just close to 60%, right? So to that population, if a settlement doesn't happen in real time or on the same day itself, they might be wondering where did my money go, right? So blockchain as a solution can offer that real time settlement will also make user experience better for both merchants as well as individual users. And what's happening, a new emerging trend, which is uh, kind of disrupting uh, the new payment landscape. It's called flow-based lending. So let's say I'm a merchant on a platform and depending upon the transaction data, I can get credit for our flow-based lending, right? So this is also picking up in a big way and uh, India Stack, uh, the team behind India Stack, iSpirit Foundation, they came up with uh, Sahai. Uh, it was expected to go live in May, but because of the COVID, it didn't, it didn't fly. So I would say uh, settlement on those lines or let's say a new line of credit or instant line of credit at a uh, point of sale where new startups can come, in, can come in and build innovative solutions so that people who are not, who do not fall in the MSME category, but they do, they do need access to credit. So a flow-based lending or transaction data-based lending is a new model which can help uh, budding SMEs, right? And it can also, I would say, democratize lending to a greater extent. Now, I think yesterday, Google Pay said that they will be getting into SME lending now. How they will do that? They will look at the transaction data that's happening on, on their platform. Let's say they have a couple of merchants. They'll look at what their transaction history is. And depending upon that, they, they will do a certain due diligence with respect to credit. And certain line of credit can be extended to those merchants. So I think a new business model will come up with respect to lending and payments uh, with the help of transaction data. Absolutely. I think, yeah, talking about new business models, I think... Uh, it's very evident that you know uh, the old consumer behavior that used to be you know pre covid you know uh, uh, is changing and certainly i think it's a, it's a scope for innovation to a lot of these companies right and thanks to you know uh, the movement of make in india and anti you know ban the chinese products so i think people started making a video conferencing tool in india yes. people started making you know an indian tiktok <laughs> you see a lot of social commerce and social media companies are coming out of India. So, I mean, good or bad, I think this leads to certain indigenous sort of production or indigenous kind of, you know, uh, making stuff uh, in the country. Absolutely. So in this, I think in this context, if you were to really understand, you know, how, uh, you know, how is India as, as a, com uh, you know, as a country to make original software? I mean, we still, you know, apart from, you know, very few people who make fundamental software, most of what we uh, typically use is from the West. Uh, right. I mean, there are few players like Haptic. Uh, I'm glad that, you know, they make original innovative products. But I think, uh, you know, very few people in the SaaS space, especially, uh, who are actually running, you know, original sort of products, right? So most of them are, are either European or, uh, or American. So, I mean, as a, as a you know, somebody in the HR space, uh, primarily and talent space, right, Sandeep? So uh, you've spoken a bit about, you know, the nuances of remote work and, you know, how the things have changed. Yeah. Uh, how, you know, identity uh, sort of management or access management uh, to employees remote or otherwise. So how are, how are things shaping in terms of, you know, providing virtual environments itself, right? Are there any new tech products? Because we see, uh, you know, virtual event platforms, right? So there are some AR, VR companies that are giving a very real time experience of an event, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's probably the ML, very kick-ass, very new age sort of products. Yeah. So in terms of providing sort of because a lot of complaints that we see are, you know, people don't like their home, you know, to work for. And I'm sure like work from home is insane, right? So yeah. do you see something new in terms of a policy level innovation? Do you some, I mean, fairly, I think technology, while, you know, we are, we are coming up with new products, I mean, new technologies, uh, hmm. there seems to be a lot of, you know, need for having, say, you know, virtual workspace, uh, HR managers, right? So 
so where they actually set the sort of required stuff to make sure uh, you have the right psyche and you have the right kind of morale and the right yes. emotional uh, sort of thing to work right so do you see some innovations in that space See, I, I would like to make a statement here. I mean, uh, it was a few years ago, I was discussing about technology with uh, my mentor and he made a very profound statement. Uh, he said, uh, uh, technology on its own, whatever it might be, and in this context, probably we can refer to software, internet, mobility, cloud, etc. But let's just say, so he said, technology on its own doesn't serve any purpose. The sole purpose of technology is to simplify, amplify and magnify human ingenuity. And uh, I mean, over the years, we felt it so profound to understand that statement that we can't just create something and, you know, take it to people and say that, you know, adopt it. That is not going to work. I mean, uh, when even Sharath was saying, 2016, when demonetization happened, I mean, I had hardly used uh, all those, uh, you know, PTM kind of stuff. But from the 2016 onwards, I mean, Every time I buy a vegetable, I just pay it by Paytm or now by UPI. So it has just changed it. I mean, I may not be a very, you know, the, the, the early adopter of technology, but people like me also, uh, who were probably, I mean, there are many people who were really hesitant to, you know, adopt to this payment gateways and all, but they just went on to adopt it without, uh, you know, much choice. So one was obviously the situation which was created. Another thing also is that, I mean, my understanding are probably, you know, whatever we have interacted with uh, the corporate side, uh, as well as, uh, you know, the other organizations, uh, we are very slow to adopt new technology. I mean, there's no, yeah. I mean, our thought is that it's very uh, clear. We are very slow to adopt the technologies unless it is either forced or it has become so, uh, uh, you know, uh, widely available and we see benefit on our own and then we adopt probably whatsapp where you really did not need to go around and you know do marketing it's just that because it is so simple that i could just quickly adopt it or you make it mandatory but otherwise we are extremely slow to adopt and most of the time you will feel that uh, uh, people will find ways to not adopt to something which can make system efficient i mean you mentioned uh, about hr space yes we have a product which is an online assessment platform and we've been experimenting it with for quite some time. Now there are elements of that online assessment platform which uh, the companies or the HR uh, is willing to adopt but there are elements which they are not. I mean they will not essentially. I mean just they are okay adopting online assessment as an assessment tool for examination but they may not be very open to adopt let's just say uh, uh, AI based interview tool. Right. right? There's an insistence to meet people, right? There's an insistence to face to face. And it, there are both pros and cons. I'm not, uh, I can't really judge whether it is the right way to go about it or not. But a lot of companies as a policy insist that we want to meet people face to face. A uh, lot of companies uh, want to do it for different reasons. So even if let's just say we build a two way communication tool and which can, you know, uh, have an automated interviewer, which will I, right, uh, ask the right kind of question. Those questions could be, you know, AI based questions wherein if I answer X, then you, you know, promote me to answer, uh, I mean, question Y. I mean, all those things can be easily built. I mean, we've tried that part of it as well. But there are very few takers to it. And I think if at all that has to change, it perhaps will take a lot of time. Uh, the, the adoption, let's just say even in online assessment space, the adoption is very slow. I mean, we can, uh, even though we say the 5%, 10% adoption, there are industries which still are not uh, gone that way. They still probably, you know, go around evaluating CVs and then conducting, uh, you know, interviews and all the stuff. On the other phase also, we see that uh, uh, on the other, other platform which we have, which is an enterprise messaging tracking platform, there we see a lot of excitement, but then also it depends company to company. Some companies are not very keen to see that they don't want to endlessly track their people. They say that we don't want to track our people, we trust them. So the adoption of tech also is, is very uh, company to company dependent, but by and large, my view is that if you bring something new to the Indian market, uh, it, it, it takes time. I mean, unless and until, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's, a, there's, there's an element of simplicity, there's an element of widespread uh, you know, benefit to it, and then probably it has to happen from the user point of view. The companies may or may try to enforce it, 
but not necessarily that they will be able to succeed. I mean, particularly in this space of enterprise messaging and tracking, uh, we know that companies want to have their own enterprise messaging tracking platform because they want to control the data. They want to control and they want to see to that their conversation, which is professional, remains with them rather than it is being done on WhatsApp or any other platform. They would want that thing to be with them. There's audit trail, there's reports and all this stuff. But it isn't always easy to change uh, that behavior because WhatsApp was always go-to for many people. And initially, a lot of people didn't realize it because it was easy, right? Mm -hmm. But now they're realizing that, yes, it is a bigger data threat. I mean, all my price list and my conversations are on WhatsApp and who's being forwarded and all that stuff. But now as there's a realization, the companies want to bring and all those things inside. But I, we feel that there is, there is a lot of resistance. Uh, sometimes from the field force and when certain things are done where you are uh, evaluated or you are, there's an audit trail of your activities, then there is a little inherent uh, you know, uh, resistance because uh, I wouldn't say that you don't, you don't want to monitor but you want little space to play around. Let's just say you're collecting a data for an organization, you want little space to play around uh, yeah. to those things. So those are, those are uh, I mean, a little constrained, but I think as, in, as we move along and try to make things simpler and people start seeing the benefit of it uh, for their own sake, I feel that adoption will become easier, but we will have to make it easier for them. I mean, there has to be a genuine reason for them to adopt it. Uh, there cannot be a way wherein we create a product and just throw it away because we feel that it will enhance productivity or we feel that it will serve the purpose. It's not what happened. Uh, it has to. It has. It has to have an approval from everybody, perhaps in that entire value chain or all the stakeholders. Then we might see a good adoption of uh, these stakes. And the other point which you made about uh, the, the this products coming out of India, yes, it has been a very I mean, structural product. Uh, we can't just blame one stakeholders, uh, but in the entire startup ecosystem, uh, there are many people who believe that if it comes from outside, it comes from US, and creating a copy of that, you know, gets us good brownie point. Uh, but our belief is that even if there are products which could be similar, the challenges we face, the challenges we in Indian context face are very different. I mean, uh, like I give an example, probably European company may not be concerned with the uh, attendance of each and every individual, but Indian company is concerned about it, right? So there are different dimensions which uh, are very local to us and we will have to create something which serves that purpose, whether it's, whether it's a a copy of a Western product or whether it's indigenous product. It has to serve something which is our own and uh, it addresses our own problem, right? So that's what uh, I feel in terms of, you know, come something coming out of India and eventually it has to come. I mean, it's a, such a huge market. Right. Uh, we have to create something. Uh, yeah. so, I mean, talking about, you know, the, uh, the whole technology adoption that you are, uh, you know, the resistance that you're referring to. I think the classic example of Paytm is like, uh, you know, demonetization, right? So, yeah. you know, soon after demonetization, not just Paytm, but all the digital payments, I think there was a huge spike in the adoption rates. And, and after that, you know, I think it became a norm. It became like quite a social norm and everybody uses it. You know, I, I see that my dad was not really very uh, fond of using digital payment. He, used, he uses Google Pay now. He uses uh, Paytm. I mean, he uses a lot of those apps. So, I mean, I think even COVID gave such an opportunity to online assessments as well, because you see that Baidu's reported a huge, uh, you know, raise of their revenues. You see that Absolutely. Zoom, fact, Absolutely. the platform that we are using, in fact, has, has one of the highest uh, growth rate, you yes. know, in the last three months itself. So I'm sure like, I think one of crisis always uh, uh, gives rise to a lot of new markets. Yes. Yes. So talking about so like, that, in fact, uh, we received many inquiries related to the descriptive assessment. I mean, the universities, uh, which used to do pen and paper. Yeah. Uh, now they want to conduct those exams on uh, you know, computer or laptop, but right, and they need a mechanism to evaluate it separately. So, like I said, you, like you mentioned, a lot of adoption is inadvertent because of the situation around. Right. <laughs> so, I mean, talking about that, I think in Swapan's case, uh, you know, how has how has this situation probably changed the kind of new businesses or you know, new markets probably that you got into that you didn't expect that you would. Because I think if you see uh, retail guys, I think, uh, you know, supply chain has really gone like huge because the need is so huge that I think suddenly grocery guys are caught right now. Yeah. Like I think that's the only business that is really running. Even when everything was off, I think that was the only business that ran. Yeah. 
I think right. uh, queries that you get in that would be far more. And so, how do you think like your case very specifically because you are into the conversational side of uh, you know virtual assistants for companies and. Uh, so i'm sure like there would have been some interesting spikes in certain areas or you know new uh, markets or new customer segments for you that probably would have come in the last yeah. few months so can you talk a little bit on that side of things yeah uh, absolutely see i think you know i i won't say there was a very obvious spike in one segment right i think what what ends up happening is you know we've ended up seeing a lot of uh, you know what ended up happening was a lot of the new age technology companies right i think the way i started seeing an actual shift right which was very interesting is everyone initially when i used to think right i mean i used to talk to these new age technology companies right and and i'm not talking about the older ones but the new age technology companies were always that hey you know what this is technology i am a technology company i can build this on my own right and i think that used to happen a lot right and i've seen plenty of companies tech first companies saying that hey you know what it's good but i don't want to buy this piece of technology i will build this piece of technology right i think what we've seen is a change there right where people have realized that hey you know what it's it's no more think that hey i'm just going to hire a lot of people and build this technology right because everyone knows that hey you know recruiting obviously you know at this time you know do you have the money for it obviously you know all of these a bunch of things that happen in just hiring good talent and being able to deliver this right obviously the need of the hour also changes right which is yes i could build this but it will take me x number of months to do it can i kind of do it uh, you know faster right so is my go to market faster and i think that's where you know we started seeing the new age commerce companies new age technology companies starting becoming a lot more adaptable on that right we got plenty of requests and actually conversations and converted people who were who were actually technology companies right and they were like you know what it's fine you give me your uh, you know solutions because yes you've been solving this problem i i want to buy this what's interesting what we had to do right and i think that was a change we did you know when you're serving companies which are technology first companies or you know kind of for those things you have to give flexibility right so yes you know we had built a bunch of things which were like hey you should use our sdk right that's the way i give it is like hey you know inside your mobile app i can give you an android sdk on your website i can give you a javascript sdk that's got to go one level lower right technology companies like to have control they're like yes it's great you've given me an sdk that will make my life easier but i can't control the ui i cannot control the experience and i want that control right so you got to then go one level deeper and be like sure i will give you the technology as a platform you are free to kind of do whatever you want on top of it right and i think that shift why you know we had to change a bunch of things to really kind of you know turn the lever there and get there right so i think that was a very interesting change we saw where uh, you know it wasn't a spike only groceries went up or only when this went up we actually have a lot of you know new age companies using our chatbot uh for you know different purposes right um, secondly i think what's happened is a lot of people have started relooking at their customer support right and i think uh, you know that's where uh, a lot of interest is coming in terms of new markets or use cases um you know i think i've seen i've started seeing less of uh, you know internal it use cases i've started seeing less of hr automation use or hr chatbot use cases and i think the reason for this is um, you know these are absolutely great use cases um, but you know i think this also comes from experimental budget then need of the hour budget right that hey i can build a chatbot where my employees can go chat with a bot and get good experiences and kind of get a lot of that at least we have started seeing less of that you know it, i don't know if that's a great representative because it could be that you know we've also don't focus a lot on those use cases right previously we used to get it while we're just out there but now we stopped get seeing a lot of that that's also because we don't do a lot of that as well right yeah. so that was the interesting one global markets and indian markets i think all have exploded equally i don't think you know there is one market that goes way beyond and the other i think uh, you know all markets the problems were there the you know the, the the situation has affected everyone globally so i think that was uh, absolutely kind of you know we've seen good trends across all markets rather than just one particular market being explosive for that matter okay 
yeah i mean uh, fair enough i think uh, there's more to you know just a spike uh, in terms of how the customers are taking i think it's good point that you know customer support is now different right it used it used to be very different back then but now it's more about chatbots and conversational sort of ai i think it's more becoming the norm uh, in terms of how customer support is so i think there you can clearly see that whole adoption uh, very 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 interesting perspective so uh, yeah i think uh, we'll take some questions from the audience i think uh, we have some questions for sharat uh, there is one question uh, that you know somebody has asked so apart from fintech how can uh, we combine blockchain with with ai to improve consumer experience so this is one question uh, probably you want to take sharat <laughs> <laughs> right so i think uh, as far as healthcare diagnostic is concerned ai plays a bigger role and uh, i mean there's a they saying that garbage in garbage out right that's where blockchain can come in and make sense whether the data which is being used for ai is it the right data or not so data sanctity or data sanity is where blockchain can come in and ai models can be built on top of that to make let's say healthcare diagnostic easier now there's a recent report where nic is looking at all uh, x ray data for covid patients so that they can come up with a full proof ai detection tool so now how are these data sources coming from so let's say if we have a interoperable data system at a national level or a, let's say national health mission level where these data points can be used for a variety of reasons right a variety of diseases or, or diagnosis so i think that will be a perfect mix of ai and blockchain where blockchain will bring in the data integrity or data sanctity part of it and ai models will help create uh, effective models business models or uh, diagnostic models and also i think the immutability of data is assured and healthcare right. and you know the privacy of data is important right so right because uh, if you look at critical uh, trial uh, and let's say if i am if i'm offering my data for trial purposes right how is it being used or misused is someone harvesting that data it so we can have a, a data monetization model for people who are offering the data for trial purposes so that that is another model which which works in us but uh, we are quite uh, far away from that yeah. but these are some of the models which can be looked at so there is one more question in and blockchain uh, you know uh, asked by shrinivas so he's, uh, so he's asking like can you throw some light on blockchain and supply chain management it's a very broad question but i think supply chain is like everything everywhere so right there are so cases i think in trade finance and a lot of mm -hmm. these areas Right. But uh, in agri, I think there are some cases that I know. So if you can probably share something more relevant. Yeah. So uh, I think one of the startups they created again a Hyderabad uh, Hyderabad based startup. If I'm not wrong, they created a blockchain solution for uh, traceability of vaccines. Yeah. Vaccines, and th I think they got funding from T Hub as well. Uh, yeah. If I'm... I forgot the name, but yeah. Right. Yeah. right. Right, right. So I think uh, let's say any vaccine. Uh, let's say if, even if a COVID vaccine comes up, whenever that comes up, uh, traceability will be quite of paramount importance. And whether we are having the right vaccine or not, right? So authenticity of, of drugs and vaccines can be one perfect use case for supply chain. Whether you track the origin of the drug or the vaccine from the lab it's being made to where it's, it's landing, maybe on the stores, or if, if you get a vaccine, maybe you can just. Get to know uh, the origin of that particular drug or vaccine. Right. Yeah. Uh, so there's like one more question. Uh, I think it's a it's an open question to all. Uh, it's more broader. Like you know, um, can can somebody throw light on investing in the future of unmanned retail and AI? So for guided stores, like AI and ML guided stores. So unmanned retail stores, I think uh, they're more like automation in terms of. so how we have these vending machines right i think there are already some concepts that that came in so so i think do you see that it's a viable thing in terms of investing in the future any of you like swapan sharad or sandeep uh, my thought on some of these things is pretty uh, clear i mean uh, as long as there is a use to it as long as it creates a value and there are people who are you know ex willing to exercise or utilize that value then it is worth investing i mean uh, uh, that's the reason primarily which we referred back uh, in your earlier question is that the western model necessarily wouldn't fly in india immediately uh, i mean you can always create something which you know has been successful in us because uh, their retail uh, uh, system work in certain way the population is not a problem you know and uh, fairly uniform society 
uh, with certain standardized way of operating. But in India, the retail market uh, uh, varies from you know probably a small five by five retail shop to huge, you know those uh, uh, the hyper stores and all. Now, I mean it's a huge spectrum to probably you know compress and bring it to a certain level where we can say that we brought into certain standardization. Yes, maybe in some of the cities uh, where the uh, the populace is uh, amenable or you know willing to adopt to certain thing, and it is just not only that you know you make everything automated and people will just pass through and everything happens. Uh, there's a lot of human element to it also. I mean, do we trust people come walking into uh, whether they will follow everything properly or uh, do we also trust people manning the gates? All those things. Uh, I mean, from my perspective plays a lot of things. I'm not saying that this thing will not come in India, eventually they will, but probably with local uh, elements to it or the localized version of that, where it may not be exactly the way it has been envisioned in you know, the Western countries, but probably with little localized factors and then, you know, a hybrid mix maybe. Right. Yeah. You know, I, I, I agree with Sandeep there, right? And I think, see, I think there's a couple of things to look at this, right? Um, you know, the biggest thing is why why unmanned AI, right? Like, why do you even want to get to that point? I think that's the first most, con you know, first question to ask, right? Is it something that, is it a problem that we really need to solve? And, you know, I think understanding that becomes the key part of it, right? Because when you understand that, hey, yes, unmanned AI probably will help me, I know, I'm just taking an example, because or unmanned, uh, you know, retail, sorry, for that matter, will help me obviously reduce uh, the kind of people I need, right? But then you have to see, okay, what role the people are playing? Are you trying to optimize that? Are you trying to optimize something else, right? And I think understanding what you're trying to solve becomes the first problem, right? And I think in the West, obviously people cost is a lot higher, right? So I'm guessing, let's say when you look at Amazon, Go or whatever those things are, they were probably looking at it from that angle that, hey, my cost of people in retail is very high. So I need to solve that. But, you know, can you, you only get rid of people who are probably doing automated work, right? Which is, okay, I can help you find where this grocery is, where that grocery is. The next question then comes is, you know, in India, is that the problem you want to solve? Or you're like, hey, my cost of people on, let's say, sales agent is high. So then you're trying to solve a recommendation AI problem uh, in, in retail, right? So then you have to structure the use case in a way that, you know what, I can help you find the product, but I will have AI which will do great recommendations for you, right? So then you solve the recommendation thing rather than an RPA automation thing, right? So, you know, you got to you gotta really find what is that because obviously, is it possible? I think it is possible, right? I mean, I don't think there is, there's no reason why this is not possible, right? Absolutely. The question is, what are you trying to solve and how do you want to solve it? you know, start with a problem and then obviously you can grow, right? I mean, if you solve the recommendation engine problem, you can probably then add an RPA to kind of solve the, you know, locating the item problem, right? And then you could go into automated checkout problem, right? Which is then you don't even need to do that. And you build AI as part of those things rather than saying that, hey, AI is the reason I am doing this. And I think, you know, I would definitely flip it on those lines and, you know, kind of go from that way because I think, uh, technology makes a lot of things possible, right? And I, you know, I'm of a true belief, you know, as a techie that, you know, I think technology can solve a lot, a lot of problems. What yes. it cannot solve, you know, as Sandeep was saying is adaptability and adaptability comes if you're solving a problem that is existential or exists rather than hey, trying to do it or you're creating a new market, but then, you know, it's consumer behavior change. There is a different approach to it. So, so I think that's how I would approach and think through that. Absolutely. I think, so this actually brings to the point, you know, like uh, we, we often, you know, discuss about this. There's so many myths around AI or for that matter, even blockchain. So all of these, uh, you know, emerging technologies. So like most commonly people ask, you know, how do I start a new company in AI? You know, very, not a little lame to you, somebody who has done it all. Yeah. But uh, still, it's a very valid question, right? So, so many people ask, you know, what, uh, and there's so many challenges, right? From uh, data to governance to a lot of things around, uh, you know, the, the policies around AI. I think open data, open AI is, is solving some of these challenges, right? And the algorithms of human biases, basically the biases that, that arise. So 
So uh, there is a lot of scope in terms of AI ecosystem. So where are we in terms of India? I think uh, we're, we're still using some of these applications of AI in a broader sense, uh, not at a level of leadership or yet, you know, talking about the very fundamentals mm -hmm. of AI. Because uh, you you see a lot of companies in India, and one of the questions, in fact, interestingly asked by the audience is, uh, is that there's so many companies in AI, ML, blockchain in India in different, uh, you know, phases, like there's some in series A, series B. Uh, so one of the questions is like, you know, which of these are more investable and, you know, the problem is once the company goes to a certain level, uh, there are all obviously the bigger companies that either can have a global perspective and go bigger uh, or, you know, uh, can kill the, the companies or, you know, acquire them. Mm -hmm. So there are two perspectives. So one, you start a company in this AI space, for example, how do you go about it and how do you get a bigger perspective where, you know, you can become that unicorn or whatever, like the Silicon Valley sort of mindset, right? Uh, I think so a lot of people want to understand this. A lot of people personally want to understand, you know, the challenges in terms of starting an AI company, running it, mainly in terms of not running an AI company. But again, as you said, you're right, uh, uh, you know, are we solving the right problem for which, you know, the AI is justified there, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so uh, um, yeah. Kashyap, my thought, I think what uh, Swapan has already referred to, I mean, the most important and most pertinent question uh, to ask is, uh, what is it solving? I mean, what is the problem it is trying to address? If we don't have, then whether it's AI or something else, I mean, I really don't see a relevance to it. And primarily because uh, you, we just, I mean, let's just say I am, uh, I just want to start a company and I feel that, you know, I have this brilliant idea which can, um, you know, run this kind of data and throw this kind of insights. Uh, but if you don't address this particular question that what problem it is trying to address, yeah, uh, then it will eventually end up making a mess. Uh, yeah. Because automation using AI and machine learning, I mean, as a process, as a, you know, method looks very uh, lucrative. It looks very exciting. But yeah. the fact of the matter is that if it is not adopted the way it should be, then we either end up making it manual automation or we make up ending a complete royal mess. Right. So even if people are trying to do something in AI space, like just in India, then there are a lot of Indian context which needs to be addressed because data, the way data is treated in India is not the way it is treated in US and Europe. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've just started talking about data privacy yeah or data sovereignty issues and how it should be managed very recently. I mean, the policies which are coming up. Uh, but we, I mean, most of us are not very clear in terms of how the data is managed in India, right? And how would it flow and what are the rights of individuals in terms of what data which is flowing across the system. So my thought uh, would be definitely, yes, there are sectors where we see um, the application of AI and machine learning, particularly the sectors which can churn humongous bit of data where there's a need to identify certain pattern. And there has to be a basis to build certain intelligence basis to whatever data you process. And that output or outcome, whatever you want to call it, has to become basis to solve some problem. Right. Yeah. If it is not, uh, then we can create a very fancy box, uh, which is of no use. I mean, in our company itself, yeah. uh, we know that we've been trying, I mean, there are always discussion that, you know, let's try to do something and, you know, create something which will be handy to some of, but we've realized that we don't have enough data to process, you know, to create patterns or to identify certain things, which will become useful to our clients or which will become useful to our users. And it is just not, I mean, even if you have, let's just say, have humongous data, but then we have to find out a way wherein we can identify certain patterns or certain intelligence out of that data, which is useful to somebody, right? And the sectors which are, which can do that definitely healthcare is uh, one of them, retail is there. And those sectors where probably you don't want to collect the data or you don't want to, you know, uh, track uh, your potential users, customers, whatever directly, but by, you know, some other way you run uh, their uh, footprints and try to build something out of it. Those sectors uh, could see a very tremendous you know, potential application of AI and machine learning. But like, again, I said that in Indian context, this has to be thought through because we are a very different set of altogether. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and I'll, I'll, one thing to kind of add there, right? And I think, Kashap, to your first point, 
one thing which i don't think a lot of people talk about is doing ai is expensive i don't you know it's not cheap uh, you know uh, especially you know when we're talking about state of the art models and hey you know can we come up with models that you know will be innovative they don't come cheap yes. you know you need gpus and gpus cost a lot of money right i mean just your processing power and you know cost a lot of money right uh, you need data as sandeep was saying which you know it's not easily available all the time right so sometimes you have to create your data right and um, you know so so you have to find a way to obviously get that money before you can start saying i'm going to do state of the art right and i think obviously you know you have universities doing that because yes you know they have the kind of capacity and the kind of funding to do it you have research centers of big companies doing it and i think that's where it's important to do a lot of that as well right because you know if you look at anywhere that's where it comes and wherever there's money you kind of be able to do that as a startup you know if you are like hey i'm going to build a state of the art model and basically make do that you have to find a way to get that money right either you raise that money and you're able to really kind of sell that vision and do it and you get that money that's fantastic it's one way to do it but that's a very hard way to do it as well and you know very hard to convince people to give you money spend a year building a model churning data and then come out with solutions right the other way is then you start a company that makes you money and as you grow eventually you start your own r&d centers and then you start doing it right so so there's a journey through this right and i think uh, you know it it depends right you can't start a company saying i'm going to build state of the art model right you have to start a company which is a company right you what is your what are you building the model for what is the end result and all that and sure you know if you can secure that kind of funding and you're able to get it and you're only able to do it in a certain amount of money that's what matters but you know you know apart from that i think that's why if you look at in the industry a lot of things that you'll see AI is now coming up as a service right all big companies are providing you models out of the box people are providing you infrastructure to run some of these models out of the box because they're optimizing these costs right but that means you're limited in a certain manner but use it in the right way connect the dots in the right way you'll be able to build great products and great impact and then you can obviously become more state of the art you know as you get deeper into that space right so i think that's the way i've always thought about it and looked at it yeah absolutely i mean you obviously need sensible companies rather than technology driven so you first need to build a company and then technology naturally takes a shape to help you there so yeah that's pretty pretty um, you know solid insight uh, so we have like a question in blockchain which is uh, you know a little complex i i'm not able to understand it fully but i think sharat might uh, uh, yeah sharat is the right guy <laughs> right so this this is a question from somebody asking you know can a platform incorporate product selling and content consuming on a single platform apart from the blockchain model so basically uh, it's like uh, you know more of a social commerce platform right so can you sell you know more like an e-commerce and also content which more like you know probably instagram with sort of the amazon in one platform which i'm sure like there are some chinese apps there like uh, you know so do we need blockchain model there if i understand is that the right question maybe you can clarify uh i would say it depends what you want to achieve right because you you can't fit blockchain to everything uh, for content i would say since uh, let's say in this in this covid time there's a lot of infodemic when i say infodemic it means deluded information false right. information and lots of information which can ch- uh, challenge the narrative or change the narrative so that's where i think uh, if if it if it's with respect to fake news right maybe we can uh, apply blockchain and use a decentralized identity management to put a check on the creators right and create model how you can incentivize those creators who are publishing on your platform a blockchain marketplace uh, I, i don't see uh, much of a use case now yeah but for a content definitely yes mm-hmm. the content on checking the genuinity of you know the authenticity original- right right in fact new york times just to uh, combat fake news they have a project called news provenance project built on hyperledger fabric where uh, they are trying to uh, authenticate people who are publishing on the platform yeah or at least get a meta metadata of of the images the origin of the images right whether this image is from syria or from some other place and it's being uh, falsely floated around to depict something else mm-hmm. yeah yeah uh so essentially yeah i think one one very basic question that was asked is you know uh, most of india's smes and businesses they spend a lot in terms of you know surviving uh, uh, 
uh, in the monopoly of e-commerce, right? Including the hyper local sectors. So can there be a scope? I mean, is there a scope for a new startup to come come up in a space where there's already a, a sort of monopoly? I think that's can tech solve the problem of you know breaking the monopoly is the question essentially. I think there is always a there's always a scope provided uh, we are able to find out one that small gap which <laughs> right. right and. Uh, it is just a matter of time somebody finds that out. I mean, we've seen a lot of innovations happen just in front of our eyes, and we thought that you know it, it was like just like that. Yeah. So, um, um, and when it comes to tech, and, and then probably I can expand this horizon of tech. I mean, you can always uh, get to the top if you have something which is phenomenal. Yeah. And uh, if you've seen last 20, 30, 40 years, whatever it might be, particularly in last 15, 20 years, uh, the the emerging tech or the cut, cutting edge tech never evolved you know, gradually. They just arrived, making everybody else dead. Yeah. You know, if you now you don't have something which is phenomenal, yeah. uh, you just get sidelined. I mean, the new technology is like you know, the dominant race which just comes in and the old one just vanishes. So I feel that if somebody had something such to offer, they can suddenly break anything. I mean, even if it looks like a completely monopolistic market. Right, right. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, I think we are almost at the probably end of our uh, discussion. So, as a very, uh, you know, probably to give some insights into this uh, as a last remark from all of you. So, like, I have this question, like, whenever I meet, like, tech guys or anybody in the business world, uh, is, like, what are the trends? It's not just about the trends, but... It's more like, what is that one segment or one company that you wish was there in the market that you don't see it? Maybe because as, as Swapan said, it could be because people undermine the cost of starting a deep tech company. I mean, the costs are very high, be it a blockchain or even, you know, uh, an AI company is, you know, very clearly said the GPUs or the computation or the kind of cloud infrastructure that you need may be very, very high. Uh, you see also quantum computing kind of companies coming. So, so one question is, what, I mean, very clearly, I mean, are there any companies that you wish were there in the Indian context that you don't see right now? Some segments probably, you know, uh, it's an open question, I think. So it's more like, cash, yaar, ye hota, you know, something like if we had that. I mean, in a country like India, I think it's a little hard not to have anything. Jugad is like everywhere, so people find, you know, solutions. I think uh, we don't have uh, maybe um, a version of SpaceX here in India, but since uh, ISRA has opened it up, we might see some good development soon. <laughs> yes. Correct. Right. And wow. I'm sure like, there, there would be a space startup uh, definitely uh, somewhere. I know some somebody in Hyderabad that, that is making rockets, which is actually funded by Mukesh Bansal. I forgot the name of the company, but they are actually building a rocket. So. I mean, India is like just amazes, but sometimes I think the, the number of people who do original uh, sort of innovation uh, definitely will be lesser, but I think that is just bound to grow. Yes, I mean, the whole investment perception on building, say, deep tech products to original products, I think is changing, largely changing, right? So, yeah. So, I think it was a great uh, discussion, uh, personally. A lot to learn from all the three of you. Sandeep, Sharath, and Swapan. I think a lot of synergies are there and what can be done, uh, you know, still the gaps and identifying that one small gap in terms of uh, looking at the market and probably exploring that business and uh, business models. So a lot of stuff, a lot of, you know, interesting opportunities arise. Uh, so, so it was great. Uh, you know, thanks. Thanks, thanks uh, Sasha. Uh, thank you for moderating thank you the everyone. question. Thank, thank you, you. Swapan, Sharath and Sandeep for the wonderful insights on how your startups are seen at the forefront of tech-driven innovation.